All right, it's just about five o'clock, so thank you all for coming and staying late on a Saturday evening after a long day of sitting. So I will do my best to give you information that I hope will be of use to you. Um, I'm really actually thrilled to see so many people interested in this topic because it's kind of a different topic than just coding. Um, and so uh, a little bit about me, I am, uh, I've been a software developer for, for a while. Um, used to be a trainer, then went into software development, and now I'm back doing training. And so this is a topic uh, I've become really, really interested in over the past couple of years as I dove back into training. Um, hold the questions until the end, uh, unless like you have like an urgent question that everything else will make sense once you get this question answered, then go ahead and do that, but otherwise hold it till the end. Um, I have the luxury of being the last of the day, which means I can, you know, have a little bit of time extra at the end. Uh, human learning. So whenever I talk about this topic, I have to explicitly say human learning, because whenever people hear learning these days, they think about machine learning. I'm not interested in machine learning, to be honest. I am interested in human learning. Um, by the way, this uh, words and buns is I've just been addicted to. I don't know why. I use it in every one of my talks. Um, there's a website. Uh, that will generate it for you, and it's just, I just find it hilarious. So, why human learning? Um, because this is what we do as software developers. So not only do we learn from others, we also teach others. And understanding how other people learn helps us better express ourselves. And so a lot of this comes from, a lot of this talk is gonna be really about sort of my experience and my learning as a trainer, but also as technical documentation or any kind of communication um, or presentation or video or anything like that, all this stuff will, will be really useful. And one of the things that I'm really uh, careful about is giving you information that as science, the best of science knows, evidence-based is best we can do this kind of uh, studying and research on things that are human. Uh, that's what I'm gonna give you. I'll also actually talk a bit about um, some common myths that you might be familiar with. So the reason I got into this, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a trainer, and one of the things that really kind of bugged me was even though I have been told I am a good trainer, I always felt like there was more I could do. That there was so much time spent sitting in a classroom or sitting in some training room or some corporate conference room, whatever, uh, and having someone do a long lecture or give you instructions to do things without really understanding what is the best way to teach people, what is the best way to learn. And uh, I was really tired of this, this wasted potential. I hate waste. And I think uh, like a lot of software developers, we hate waste of, of any kind. Some efficiency and effectiveness is really important. And so I started looking around and I happened to come across, I feel really lucky that I came across this book. Uh, it's called How Learn Learning Works, um, Seven Research-Based Principles. And so I feel lucky because, as I said, I'm really interested in things that are research-based, right? Not everything science concludes is correct, right? We've all seen, you know, all the backpedaling of things like, you know, you know high-fat diets versus low-fat diets, sugar, all these kinds of things turns out maybe not so great. But as best we can, these principles are research-based. So I kind of got a little addicted. Um, this is my personality. Once I start learning about this stuff, I want to learn more. So I got this book. The title is kind of weird. It's weird in the sense that the, the title is, Why Don't Students Like School? I mean, what, what does this have to do with learning? Is like, but really, it's written by a cognitive uh, psychologist and actually he, cognitive scientist, and he goes through more research and more bringing in the understanding that we currently have of how the brain learns. So after that, I kind of said, oh, let me look at the bibliography, see what research papers are being cited. And so I started looking at this research paper, cognitive load theory. And so this, um, and I'll talk in more detail about cognitive load theory, but it's like, oh, this is really cool. And so I took, read another paper on introduction to multimedia learning. When I read this, it's like multimedia, that feels like such an old fad kind of word, but all multimedia means is you're learning from different media, right? If you're looking at a video and you're hearing a voice, that's multimedia. So totally relevant, more so today than, than, than in the past. 
And then uh, why tests appear to prevent forgetting. So the whole idea of forgetting and remembering and how that works and how we can take advantage of the idea of forgetting to help us retain information better. And so I'm the kind of person that once I start reading this, I started getting the books. And if you know anything about this publisher, Springer, you know these books are not cheap. Um, and I kind of, things got a little out of hand. Um, I have found that having a stack of books does not mean that you've gained any knowledge. <laughs> Science, you know, works. So there's a lot of information. There's a lot of information I could talk about. I could talk for, for hours on this. I will not, so don't worry. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, sort of what is learning. And it's not as obvious a term as it might appear. And then I'll look at sort of how does the brain learn? What are the parts of the brain? How does memory, attention, long-term memory, how do these things work together so that we can actually learn? Uh, we'll look at some theory and evidence. And then I'll uh, sort of the best part is examples. And if there's one thing you take away from this talk is whatever you do, if you're writing documentation, if you're doing a presentation, if you're doing anything, examples, 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 examples. Concrete examples is what novice sort of learning starts with. And then the more we see, the more we're able to abstract patterns from that, and then we can start learning at the theory. So this is one phrasing of what learning is. And maybe not the most straightforward definition, um, but really, the goal of most learning is about storing and connecting knowledge in long-term memory. Long-term memory is the best thing ever. So if we want to maybe rephrase it, we could phrase it like this. So we want to be able to retrieve it from long-term memory when we need it. If we're able to do that and then apply it, then we could say we've learned. So first of all, how does stuff get into long-term memory? Well, it starts off with something called working memory. Uh, I like to call it working attention because there's this active aspect to absorbing information, right? We get sensory information comes in. Um, we have this thing called the central executive, which is responsible for paying attention, for guiding our attention. There's this kind of theory called the spotlight theory. It's like we focus on something. We're still getting stimulus elsewhere, and right? I'm still hearing words flow through the wall here. But hopefully, you're paying attention to me because your focus is up here. And you may be aware of it, and especially now that I pointed it out. But your attention will probably go back to, to me, uh, I hope. And so uh, the different parts of the working memory that are involved are what's called a visuospatial sketch pad. So this is where sort of your, the image that comes in gets stored for a very short period of time. There's uh, the episodic buffer, which has to do with sort of more experiential memory. And the last thing is this thing called a phonological loop, which is super handy in the days that we used to have to memorize phone numbers. Because what we could do is we could, in a sense, sort of take the output of our, that part of our brain and put it right back into the input and keep doing that to retain that information. Right? So you're kind of walking to where you can write something down, you're repeating it over and over again. That's the phonological loop in action. And that's because after a second or two, it's gone. If it's not refreshed, kind of like dynamic memory. If it's not refreshed, then it, it's gone. Same thing for the visuospatial sketch pad. It goes away if, it, if nothing happens to it after a few seconds. And so the idea is to have this stuff be long enough in the working memory and pay attention to it and be able to process it that you can put it into long-term memory. So putting it into long-term memory, the whole idea is to make connections. Making connections is the most valuable thing and really the only thing that matters in putting things into long-term memory. So if we think of long-term memory like this, so a bunch of connections, things are connected. As you learn something new, you connect it to things that exist. And this is a key point. Whenever you are teaching somebody a new concept, or even if it's a concept maybe they know, you have to check. There's this thing, the technical term is prior knowledge. What do they know? 
right? especially if you're doing tutoring or small classroom, you want to find out what do they know so you can help connect it with what they're, the new information with what they already know. And so as you learn new things, you connect them and the connections get stronger and you start building up more complex connections and more and more connections get put together until you now have a nice set of, of long-term memories. So as a concrete example, learning the concept of, for example, multiplication, if you already know addition, you can connect multiplication to that. You can say, oh, it's repeated, iterated, addition. If you didn't know what addition was, how could you possibly learn what multiplication is? You might be able to figure that out. You might be able to learn it. But, and this is where instructional design and curriculum designers come in to figure out what is that primary piece of information that then everything else sits on. Because if you don't have that good foundation, stuff falls apart. And you may retain some of it, right? So like kind of in the lower right, you kind of have some knowledge, but because you didn't have that good foundation of the primary information, you were not able to build on it properly. And the way to detect that is to ask people, not say how much experience do you have in this or how much time have you spent doing this, but ask them actual questions. Um, as a trainer, I, I, I talk with companies to do training and one of the things I say is, great, can you have the students fill out a quiz so I can find out what they know? They say, no, no, we, we, we figured out how much experience they have. This one has one year experience, this one has two years experience, this one has three months. I'm like, that tells me nothing. I need to know exactly, can they answer, so I teach Java, can they answer, what is a subclass? How would you write that? What does that mean? What's the accessibility, right? I have to ask them very specific questions to find out their prior knowledge. So this is all about putting stuff into long-term memory. To a certain extent, that's easy. Uh, it's actually retrieval that's the hardest part, right? We built up, especially, you know, our, some people at my age, it's like, the stuff's in there, but can we get it out? Can we get it out when we need it? Long-term memory is huge, huge. Um, attempts to measure it is like, we don't know how big it is because we haven't hit the limit in, in any kind of experiments that we've done. What's hard is to recall it after it's been sitting there for a while. After it's been just, you haven't accessed it, you haven't thought about it, you haven't talked to somebody about it. And so after it's disused, you forget. And so there's this thing called the forgetting curve. So a gentleman named Ebbinghaus studied this and published a paper, and so the forgetting curve is what happens to all of us, right? As we're learning, and we're constantly learning and building on that learning, right? So if you're taking a training course or a class, right? Slowly, your, your knowledge is building and, and building and building. And then you leave, and you go back to your desk, and it's like, boom, you've forgotten a lot of it. Basically, time. So over time, you forget. Um, it doesn't matter. This is, this is the, you could, the, the, in terms of the length of time, uh, it really depends. It's completely topic or content dependent. And so the experiments that have been done are a lot about word lists or placement of things on the screen, uh, but they've been replicated in various, various ways. Yeah? Is this loss of memory or loss of access to memory? What's the difference? <laughs> right? So, so, the, so we know it's in long-term memory. The problem is we can no longer recall it, and so that means we have forgotten it. And so what we want to do is we want to exercise that. And so there's this concept called retrieval practice. And so going back to, you know, the, my whole goal of doing this research is to figure out how can I get people to learn and retain what they've learned longer. So uh, what I did in my classes is I have, uh, I give people at the beginning of a class, here's your learning journal. This is where you will write all your information, all the things you learn, all the mistakes you've made, the things you were confused about, you will write them in this journal. And I give them specific prompts, you can see here on the right, specific questions to trigger the kinds of things I want them to write in the learning journal. And so uh, I will ask them how to relate it to things they're doing in their work, how to relate it to, to things they might be confused about. And all throughout you know, my classes, I will constantly remind them to write in this and look back and retrieve, basically go back and use that as a way to, to help them retrieve information. So that's one way. Another way is through what's called the testing effect. So it turns out lots and lots of experiments have been done on students because we often have lots of students, especially in colleges, to work with. And the very act of being tested helped them learn better. And 
this may not be surprising, but uh, students scored significantly higher on the tested material if they were tested. And so there's this whole area of retrieval practice, this website is really uh, good coverage of it, that says do more testing. And you know, you know, students may not like it, but they don't like it because it's, they sort of fail at it. And so in order to actually help them succeed, we have to test them more. And I always think about like, you know, unit testing and, and software development, it's like same thing, if I run tests more and write more tests and do it more often, it becomes easier and better. And so we wanna do the same thing uh, when we're learning. And so if we're doing it to ourselves, we don't wanna just read material and then reread it because we have a horrible way of judging how much we know. When we read something and then reread and say, ah, oh, yeah, I know this. You actually don't know until you have maybe give yourself literally a test. Write yourself some questions and then later on answer those questions without looking back at the book. You will be surprised how much you actually do not know that you thought you did. So there's this concept called judgment of learning and we are awful at it. And that's why like, you know, information about, hey, how well do you know topic X is irrelevant? Because we don't know until we actually get tested on actual content. So there's this other concept to help learn what's called desirable difficulties. Uh, and it's a, a, a researcher named Bjork. And so he looked at how do we better encode this information? How do we make it so that it's more likely for that information to be going into long-term memory? So one way is what's called spaced retrieval. Waiting between, between the time you learn something and recalling it. And so thinking back to that forgetting curve, if you stop at any point along that curve and try to recall it, you will strengthen that memory. And there's optimal times to do this. In fact, there are tools, Anki is one of them, flashcard tools, that will measure how well you're doing and will space out the material. The better you know it, it will space it out further. The idea is to make it really difficult to work with. And the more difficult it is, then if you succeed, you are much better at recalling that information. And so it's very much like working out, right? You work out and then it becomes easy, and so what do you do? You don't just keep working it out at that level, you use more weights or more repetitions. And the very act of recalling re-encodes that information and makes it easier to retrieve. A process called interleaving, mixing it up with other information, that uh, also is a desirable difficulty, so it makes it a bit harder, but we, it's a good kind of hard. And the last one is changing your environment. Right? So if you always study at the same table and you know it backwards and forwards, you go to then a different environment and you realize you don't know it as well because the more you are exposed to it in different environments, the more you can generalize. So making memory stronger through these desirable difficulty techniques is one way to, to help you learn. There was a theory about what's called disfluency, the idea that making things harder to read by using a special font that is hard to read somehow makes you work harder and therefore you will remember it better. Seems like an interesting theory, right? If I have to focus more and concentrate more, then it's much more likely that I'm gonna remember it. Turns out, not so much. Um, initial studies said, yes, this works. Uh, later studies said, eh, and there was more research, more research, and it's really kind of inconclusive. And so the way I look at this is like, sort of do no harm, don't do something like this unless it's really obvious because otherwise it's kind of harmful. Um, but I do love the name of this paper which is called Fortune Favors the Bold and the Italicized. <laughs> so working memory, working memory is limited. In fact, it's more limited than you may have heard. You may have heard that working memory is seven plus or, two, plus or minus two items. Nope, it's actually three or four. Uh, this paper by Nelson Cohen is a great paper, and I, I love the titles of some of these papers. The Magical Mystery Four, right? How is working memory capacity limited and why? So it turns out that, that the original seven plus or minus two was when errors started happening. So it's actually much lower if you want to stay within the realm of not making errors. And so we have to handle these working memory limits. This limit cannot be changed. Despite what some companies may promote, with cognitive gyms and this kind of thing, there's no evidence that anything you do will improve the working memory size. And there's been a lot of research about this, and so far, no. You can't change it, it's basically defined early on. What you can do, though, is 
If you're juggling these things, you can juggle larger and larger things through a process called chunking. Right? The more you learn about complex topics, the more you have experience with them and work with them, you can start chunking these memory limits because they're actually units of memory. They're chunks of memory. They're not just some small indiv individual part. They are whatever the chunk happens to be, and you can make those larger. Right? So if you only have limited ability you can, to juggle, well, juggle larger boxes that you can put other stuff in. And so this idea of chunking or creating what are called schemata in a research parlance, um, that's, that's one way of doing it. The other thing is, is mental effort, how much focus you have to do. And this goes back to the theory of cognitive load. So the cognitive load theory says you have limited space and mental resources available. So how can we best make the use of it when we're trying to, to teach and learn? We want to reserve as much of that right, kind of processor time for encoding that information, for chunking it, and for putting it in long-term memory. If we have to worry about other things, like we're distracted because we're listening to music, or by conversations next door, or next desk over in our wonderful open office space plan, um, then this imp impacts how much we can learn. So this is what cognitive load is. It's the load imposed on an individual's working memory by a particular task. And so the cognitive load theory talks about three parts of this load. The intrinsic load has to do with what is the thing you're learning? How complex is that? Right? Learning addition and subtraction for somebody who's somewhat familiar with that is much, much easier than learning quantum physics. Right? So the learning material defines a certain amount of complexity, a certain amount of difficulty. And the only way you can change this load is by changing what they're learning. And so again, this goes back to the prior knowledge. What do they know so I can fit it with what they know so I can make it a little bit easier to take that next step? Teach them addition before I teach them multiplication. On the right is germane load. And this is uh, when you're developing materials you want to focus on because this is how much kind of ability you have, resources you have to learn the material. So it's directly associated with the material. Then extraneous load is all the other stuff that's in the way that distracts you. And I am always amazed, now that I have sort of this lens to look at things, how much extraneous stuff there is when we're trying to learn. Whether it's documentation or examples, how much stuff is there that, oh my god, why are you telling me all this? And I'll show some examples about that. And the problem here also is, is that as experts who are developing this, they don't see it. As experts in material or knowledge, we don't see this extraneous, and so we, it doesn't bother us as much. But novices, everything looks relevant. They, they can't tell the difference. So some learning principles, some evidence of things that you want to do and maybe not to do. So first of all, a uh, quick cycle on, on uh, experience. And so basically, learning is you do something, you observe the outcome, you get timely feedback. And this feedback part is really important. If you don't get feedback, how are you going to learn? Right? It's, it's sort of like learning how to drive with your eyes closed. The feedback is probably going to be you hit something. Not the best way to learn. And so the feedback has to be timely, and there's a whole area of research of what is timely. Because is it too soon? In fact, giving the answer to a question too soon actually impedes learning. You, all, you, you sort of want students to struggle with it a little bit. And I know as a trainer that sometimes hard you ask a question to a class and all you get back is blank stares. And I was like, let that sit for a while. And then give them, give them feedback. But timing that, lots of really interesting research there. And, whoops, and then reflecting. How did I do, what can I do differently? Um, this whole area of metacognition, thinking about how we learn and how we take in information and adjusting what we do to take that into account. So if the feedback is not timely, if it takes too long to get that feedback, it's much harder to learn. And again, I like to associate this back to sort of test-driven development versus putting something out there in production and maybe getting uh, something an hour later that you find out something is wrong. Both have their value, but I, if I can get that quick feedback, I want that quick feedback right away so I can do something about it. So some concrete things to do. 
there's a thing called worked examples. And so worked examples are showing you, if you, for example, if you're doing long division, here's how you do it step by step. There's, when creating materials for, for learners, there's this tendency where we as people who are developing this say, oh, well, I have to make sure they, I don't give them too much information, otherwise it's too easy. And I've made this mistake as a, as a trainer, and I'm always like amazed that how, how sort of difficult it is as a novice, right? The curse of expertise. It's easy for us when we know it, but we've forgotten what it was to not know it. And maybe it feels like cheating if you give them the answer, but they need that because they have no other knowledge. And so starting them off with these worked examples that provide specific guidance, taking them step by step. And I know I've, I've been writing some, some new uh, lab exercises, and I'm looking at this like, I may as well just give them the code. What, what, like, what are they doing? But it's like giving them step-by-step -step examples. They need that starting out. Later on, I can make it harder on them. But starting out, I need to give them that. And so this does what's called scaffolding learning. Right? You need to set up structure so that they can absorb this information because it's completely new to them. And what's the worst thing that happens? They blow through it. They get it done. And it's very easy. Maybe they're a little bored. I'd much rather have that because that's easy to handle, I can just throw more lab exercises at them, than for them to be completely lost at the, at the get-go. In case I haven't mentioned, we learn well from examples. So make sure you create them carefully. Make sure if you're using them from elsewhere that you curate them carefully. So here's a worked example. Um, this is from a, from a class I teach on Java, and here I'm describing and giving them a couple of examples on how to create a Java bean. If you've been programming in Java for any non-trivial amount of time, you might say, ugh, this is like trivial, child's play. Yes, for you, but for someone new to it, this is completely, every single line of code here is completely new. And I actually had made a mistake when I first developed this, uh, this basically this manual for their, for their learning. Um, I gave them information that was not relevant to the lab they were working on, and they got really confused. They thought, well, if I gave them this example, it must be important. And it was like, oops, it was not at all important. I actually, you don't need to know this other thing. I was just like copying and pasting and I didn't realize what I was doing. And so what you want is eventually you're gonna do what's called fading. You're gonna remove the scaffolding, right? As they learn more and as they build up that foundation and you're sure they build it up because you're asking them very specific questions. You're having them do very specific things and they can do it. Then you can start removing that scaffolding, that support. Right? The better they get, the less scaffolding you give them. And if they blow through things, then good, you take the scaffolding away more quickly. So watch out for prior knowledge and too much information, too much cognitive overload. Um, this is a perfect example of the problem. Uh, this is taken from a send mail example, so, uh, sorry, mail gun. Um, if you are new to this, like I was, I was, I happened to be just looking at this API, and I thought, oh my god, I have no idea what some of this is talking about. I so this uh, example is using curl, and it's using a bunch of parameters sending into curl. And so, if you have no idea what curl is, this is just gobbledygook. And but okay, I'm a programmer, and I've, I know curl, and and still there's stuff here I I, I don't understand. First of all, this example is not runnable. Right, because there's stuff that I would have to put in here that has to do with my username and my API key and things like that. Okay, so that means it's a little bit of work for me to get this up and running. But I have to know what curl is. I have to know what dash dash user is. I, I, I'm a, I use curl a lot and I didn't know what that was. I have to know what dash f is. I didn't know what that was. There's so much here that I could possibly not know that it makes this a horrible work exa uh, worked example because they could have given me less. They could have said, here's two lines, do this. Then here's three lines, do that. Then here's four lines. And if I already knew those first steps, good, then I could skim through it and go to the last part. But in a lot of the documentation I see every single day, it's like, here's the one example that includes every option. Which is like, I don't want every option. I, I want that one option in the middle. How do I do just that? And then there are two, uh, two entries. Why are there two? Is that important? And so the, again, this is the novice versus expert. Is this important or is this extraneous? 
And if you don't know what MIME is, then you're like, what, what the heck is this MIME thing? And what are these log entry things? Right, so all these things are packed into this example as if somebody was being paid per example. It's like, you know, we're not trying, you know, I remember the old days when manuals and documentation used to come on paper, and so we'd have limited space, and we'd have limited number of pages. Uh, the web is kind of not have that constraint, so let's maybe take advantage of it. And so, um, really, this kind of thing just, just, now that I'm sort of more aware of it, bugs the heck out of me. And so I apologize if now you're gonna look at examples and it will bug you as well. So there's another teaching technique, and again, to reduce extraneous information, there's this thing called Parsons problems. And it's a way of teaching someone how to code who's new to the language. Because one of the hard parts about most programming languages, other than like Scratch or, or sort of visual programming languages, is you have to type text, which means you have to get things like indentation right semicolons in the right place, curly braces in the right place, indentation, using spaces, or t all sorts of stuff that really isn't the thing you wanna learn, right? You'll get those later, those will become second, you know, second nature. And so what Parsons problems allow you to do is focus on, in order to get this thing to work, what order do I have to put these statements in? And so an actual example you might look like this where you have the before, and you have these four things that you wanna put in the correct order, and you slowly drag them to the bottom, and then you drag other ones to the bottom and put them in the right place, and move them around, and then get the indentation right until finally you get the right answer. Now again, if you're a, you know, a programmer, and you know not lots of different languages, this would be like, I could just type this, that's, that's fine. But not everybody knows that. And allowing them to focus on where do these statements go? Where's the, sort of outer part of the loop. Where does the indentation happen? That's important conceptual stuff that you need to get, that you wouldn't get if you were focusing on, do I have to indent this? With how many spaces? Do I need a semicolon here? Things like that. Another thing that really helps is what's called sub-goal labeling. What I used to call putting headers in text. Um, a lot of times you, I'll encounter text that's just like paragraph after paragraph of paragraph after paragraph of just stuff, undifferentiated, very hard to scan. And so if you're giving somebody instructions, and I learned this the hard way because one of the core things I do when I'm training is focus on the lab exercises and what are lab exercises other than a list of instructions of what to do. And I was constantly like, why are people skipping over this stuff? It, it's like, it's right there, it's step 35. Why did you skip that over? <laughs> and after a while, I realized that, and then, then sort of intuitively, I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should break this down. And then there's been actual research on this topic called sub-goal lab labeling. Um, and so here you have, you know, undifferentiated stuff on the left and where you put in headings to tell them what the goal is for each section. Because remember, they have no idea what they're doing if they're following just step after step after step. Like, they're, you, they're, made, they're just following a script and you may as well have just, you know, done it for them. Um, one of the things that as an instructional designer, right, developing instructional materials or documentation or things like that is what's called the expertise reversal effect. By trying to make things easy for novices, turns out you make things harder for experts. And so I would say, use hypermedia, AKA links. Ask people, do you know this? And don't just say, do you know this? Ask them a question that would prove whether they know this. If they don't know it, then you can give them sort of more novice level information. If they don't know, sorry, if they, if they don't know it, you can give them more novice level information. If they do know it, great. Put them on a new page that says, I assume you're an expert because I've, in a sense, tested you and seen where you're at, and now I can give you more complex information. We don't just have static, this is not 1996. We don't have just static web pages. We have, stat, we have web pages that are applications. We can ask questions, get responses, and take action based on those responses. Why should documentation be any less? Another thing to watch out for is what's called a split attention effect. And this happens all the time. You may not realize it's going on, but this happens all the time, even in the tools that we use. 
what you want to avoid is having to look at one place for some information, go back to another place to do something, then go back to, to the first place to find out more information, then go back to the other place to do something. That's split attention. And that shifting back and forth is really, really hard. And so, uh, in fact, IntelliJ Idea from the wonderful JetBrains folks, um, they solve this a bit. So if you've ever gone into a debugger, you typically have you know, at least two parts, two or three parts in, in, in the debugger. You've got your code at the top, you've got the sort of where you are in the call stack on the left, and information about kind of currently where you are in the variables uh, on the right. So if you're trying to debug stuff, you're trying to look at, okay, I'm on this line of code, what's the value of this variable? Let me look in the lower right, figure out what that is, go back to the code, figure out what I need to look at next, and go back, right? So you're constantly moving back and forth. So what, what they did in IntelliJ is put it right there in the code. As you're debugging it, here's the values. You probably were looking at it anyway, so let's put it right there so you don't have to look elsewhere. And so this is an example of, of solving the split attention problem. The other thing you want to do is leverage dual coding. So I'll, I'll touch on this a bit later, but we basically have two main avenues of getting information, visually and orally. And a lot of information can be absorbed visually as well as orally, but you have to be careful. So one thing you may not have noticed, or maybe you noticed, as I was displaying slides that had a lot of text, I didn't say anything. Because if, if I read over while there's a lot of text that you're reading, they're competing. Reading text and hearing text, those are going through the same sort of avenues in the brain, and they're going to conflict. So you want as much as possible have images, with a little bit of text is okay, and narration over that, those don't compete. So you want to avoid this competition between the two. And you want to use them together, because if you use them together, you get even more benefit. Right? So you want to use both pathways, not just one. Because if you try to put it all in one, then you, know, you just have lots and lots of text on the screen without any images. Um, but the images also have to be related. So be careful of just throwing in arbitrary images. Another thing that, that I find really useful is what are called concept maps. And so concept maps are ways of relating little bits of knowledge to each other. And this is, I find this really useful when I'm trying to figure out, okay, I need to explain this thing on the right. Uh, so I teach Spring as part of my Java Spring training, and there's this thing called REST template. Okay, so what do they need to know in order to know REST template? Well, they need to know this stuff, whoops. They need to know, let's see, yeah. They need to know REST, so they need to know what REST is. They need to know this thing called get object. They need to know this entity thing. They need to know this URL template. And then for each one of those, I go back and say, okay, in order to know REST, you need to know HTTP. In order to know HTTP, you need to go back and back and back until you get to something that is sort of more foundational. And that's a way of figuring out, okay, here are all the things I need to teach them first. Then I can start building up my knowledge. And for an expert, this, going through this process is really helpful. If you want to learn about concept maps, it's also helpful to look at concept maps about concept maps. So this concept map is about concept maps, and you can look at it and read through it. Um, when I put the materials up, you can get a link to this. And so uh, re looking through the concept maps, creating them as an expert for figuring out what you need to teach, but also it's a great way to figure out what does somebody know. You say, fill out a concept map for this starting concept, and have them create those linkages. And then query them. OK, you wrote something here. What else do you need to know here? And if, and once they're done, you can see where their gaps are. You can see, oh, they got these things, but they connected these two things that are totally, like, really distant. And so it's a nice way of, of figuring out what is, their, what is their current knowledge. Okay, learning myths. So this, there's a couple of things that um, people think are just, and take for granted, and I have been one of these who used to believe some of these. Um, the first one is what's called Dale's Cone. Anybody ever see something like this? Or maybe something like this? These are complete and utter garbage. <laughs> Some hints as to why you, you might think these are garbage. So, you know, the idea that 
I learn 90%, I remember 90% if I teach to others, and I remember 50% if I, I'm in a discussion group, but I only remember 5% from a lecture. First of all, these are strangely round numbers. Wow, 50% precisely? I've never seen a study that 50% is the actual number that comes out. Um, if you trace this back, it's just, uh, it's just utter garbage. But unfortunately, a lot of folks think this is true. Now, there may be, there, you know, in any kind of good myth, there's always some kernel of truth. Yes, it might be better that teaching others is more effective to learning than listening to a lecture, but it totally depends on the content or what you're doing, or how, what the lecture is, or, or what you're trying to teach, that kind of thing. So, complete garbage. Uh, it's, it's garbage enough that, so one of the things about the, the research that I look at is, does it give me information that will change something in what I do? And this gives me a little bit like, okay, I know if you're doing, like if I'm teaching programming, I know there's only so much I can show you code before I have you do it. Great. So I need this is better than that. But in terms of percentages, that, that really doesn't help. The other big myth is what are called learning styles. So the idea is that people differ in, the, in how effective they absorb, sort of different forms of absorbing information. And so the, what, what are called modes, these modes are typically shown as visual, sort of read and write, uh, sorry, oral, auditory listening, read, write, words, and kinesthetic, which I kind of have to laugh at a little bit because, oh, let's dance our way to learning programming. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. If you have good vision, you are a visual learner, period. That's it. Trying to teach someone to their preferred mode, there have been papers upon papers, in fact, special issues of psychological journals saying this does not make any sense. It does not give you any actionable information to create better learning materials. It may be true that some people prefer listening versus watching video, fine. But I'm not going to teach you something that requires, right, let's say, art. I'm not going to teach you about art through talking about it. I'm gonna pay attention to what is the content I'm trying to teach you and try to adapt the way of teaching it according to that content. So there's no data that supports anything like this, um, yet you will find if you go into most schools and even some univer most universities, people still believe this, the teachers believe this viscerally, and it is not at all true. Yeah? Uh, so learning disabilities is, is a separate thing. So that's completely separate. This idea, so, yeah, this, this idea is simply that, you know, people who like to listen to stuff and that's their preferred mode, they may have that as a preferred mode, but that does not mean you teach all topics and all subjects in that mode. Okay. I'm saying that everybody's a visual learner, and if the topic is visual, you will teach it visually. If the topic is oral, you would teach it through audio. If the topic is kicking a ball, you will teach them by kicking a ball. So you would, it's always adapt the learning mode to the content, not to some preference that they might have. Yeah, question. Well, so the, yeah, and, and, I, and I'd have to, we'd have to look at specific examples to examine that. So no, um, there are specific ways to teach that that have, I would look at what are the evidence-based ways that have been randomized control trials for how to teach people with different learning disabilities, and I would look to that for, for how to properly teach it. So the idea of, of phonics and things like that, there's a lot of research that backs up, here are the right ways to teach reading, for typical kids, here's the right way to teach for kids with certain types of disabilities. And so I would be looking at what does the educational psychology research say for those specific things. But it has nothing to do with learning styles. Learning styles is the idea that you prefer to hear things, so we're gonna teach you everything through hearing. You prefer to work with your hands, so we're gonna teach you everything through working with your hands. And that's not a... 
that you might use different modes depending on what the material is, not depending on what the person says their preferred way of learning is. Okay, so let's do some retrieval practice. So what is learning? Access long, yeah. What's accessible from long-term memory when needed? What are some ways to improve that access? Testing, what else? Practice, right, retrieval practice. Some examples of retrieval practice, so testing, spacing. What do you need for correct learning? Feedback. Feedback. When do you need it? Timely fashion. And working memory, so working memory is small, cognitive load theory. Um, you want to guide but not distract the learner, such as with what are some things that are distracting? Yeah? Extraneous. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. There was the one with the IntelliJ, JetBrains. Yeah, separate, split attention. So split attention or extraneous material. And some examples of examples, what might those be? What were the different kinds of examples I talked about? Uh, no, some specific, so concept maps was, was one. The guided ones, what were they? Parsons problems, and the other one was worked examples. See, by even trying to re recall it, even if you didn't successfully recall it, it still helped strengthen that, that connection. And don't waste your time with learning myths such as, anybody remember the, yeah, Dale's cone, the 10, 20% thing? And what was the other one? <laughs> learning styles, all right, you have passed. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'll take any questions, yeah. Oh, teaching somebody to unlearn, that's super, super hard. Um, there have been some studies in psychology classes of how do we teach people to unlearn some of these myths about psychology. It's really hard. It is super, super hard. Even with like lots, like there is a bunch of research on that and it's just really hard. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so Bloom's ta taxonomy um, is a really good guideline uh, for those of you who know about sort of like what are the different levels of, of figuring out whether you've learned, it, learned something, do you understand it? So um, they actually rewrote that sometime in the early 2000s, and that's totally useful for a guideline for creating uh, learning materials. Yeah. No, it just means you, you would, so depending on uh, what you're doing, what you're, um, what you're looking at, what your knowledge level is, um, you may find it distracting. Uh, I know that, that I, I mean, I've been using IntelliJ for 20 years, so I find it very easy to use and very intuitive. And then I see people new to it, it's like, oh my God, they're making mistakes where it's like, yes, that's obviously difficult. So it's not that, I mean, we still have preferences. Right, when we still have, have things that... Yeah, I've used it, let's say, 10 years, so not new to it, but I categorized it as status code, that's the guardian, that's the So, and, and so, you know, we are not all the same people. We, we still have different brains that operate somewhat differently, um, and that's why they allow it as an option you can turn on or off. <laughs> Yes, in fact, I had a note to myself to, to mention that and I for, or forgot. Sleep is one of the most important learning things that you can do. Um, when I teach classes, uh, and I'm actually teaching a class of, of new college grads, and they're like the sleepiest group I've had in a while. And I'm like, you folks n are not learning as effectively because all the consolidation of long-term memory, and there's lots of good studies, especially now that we have um, really good imaging machines and other things, we can really 
do better experiments. And so, yes, sleep is super critical for learning. Uh, there's a question, yeah. So, yeah, um, there probably is, but it will depend on the material. It depends on how much sleep you have. It depends on not just the, the topic that you're trying to learn, but how are the learning materials? How good are they? Um, you know, how often you have to take a break and, and things like that. Uh, there was, there is this sort of another semi-myth that, oh my God, you can't pay attention to a lecture for more than seven minutes or something. A lot of you paid attention for 45 minutes. And like this wasn't a movie or anything like exciting. Like we can do this, and it really depends on what's your motivation and interest. What is the topic? How is it presented? Um, and really, there probably is an optimal that you would have to find out for yourself. But you can measure. You can probably do some experiments on your own. Yeah. Question here. There's also a bunch of studies that are done on uh, older folks like like me. Um, because they're looking at it from the, how do we, how does our memory go? How do, what happens, you know, Alzheimer's, but not even just sort of disease kind of stuff, but also um, there are a, a whole bunch of studies that, that focus on that. Yes, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff is like for elementary or, or uh, higher education, um, sort of adult education uh, gets less attention, but a lot of this stuff can, can still apply. But there is also research for all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, Mark. Yeah, so I, don't, I didn't cover sort of memory palaces and, 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 and those kinds of things. Those are super, super powerful because they rely on our visual memory, which is much, much larger and richer than sort of memorizing text. And so there's, there is research on that that shows how, how powerful that, plus mnemonics, absolutely, there's research that totally supports that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. L let me get her because you, yeah. Yeah, so, um, the, right, there's the old joke of, you know, lec lectures are, you know, basically passed through the, the student right onto the paper. Um, what I recommend is, is take fewer notes, but reflect right afterwards, like uh, either in between sessions or classes or whatever the thing you're learning is, take 10, 15 minutes and write down stuff. Because that way you're, you're, you're starting to process and re-encode that information. That's why I talked about the retrieval practice learning journal stuff that I do. Um, because if they do nothing else and just take the notes, now they're going from memory. And they can also realize, oh, I thought I knew this other thing, and I realized I don't have it written down. That maybe means I have forgotten it, and I need to go back and figure it out. Um, so that's sort of a general recommendation. There is some research on some notes. Not a whole lot, a whole lot though. Uh, let me take some, yeah. It's an analogy. Basically, the idea is you want, to, you want to work hard to retrieve things that you want to remember. If it's harder to retrieve, but you end up retrieving it, that solidifies that ability to retrieve it. Um, you like weights. You don't want to all of a sudden go from lifting 10 pounds to lifting 100 pounds. That's kind of ridiculous. So it's, it's a good analogy, but I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't go too far. Yeah, well, and that's where sleep comes in really, sleep is really important. Spacing, time, so you want to put, do spacing, and this is where space learning comes into play. It's like, you don't want to cram, right? So you, just like you probably wouldn't want to like do a crazy workout, you know, that is the maximum you've done, uh, and then like do nothing for a week, right? You want to space it out and retrieve it on a regular basis um, and start retrieving it further and further apart to, to make it harder. And if it becomes easy, then you can either, maybe you're done, maybe you've learned what you need to learn, right? So this is more about the factual recall. Um, but the more you space it out, the, the harder you make it. I think from what I've heard as a layperson, that you're building up synaptical connections, which is totally different than a muscle. 
Yes, I mean, you know, it's still an analogy that is not, you know, 100% translate. You are making, the more connections you make, the, the more paths and possibilities of, of paths to get to that, that information. So, yes? So it depends on the content and the learning materials, but there is some, some research on what is timely. So there is this whole area of cognitive tutors, which are computers, programs, that teach things. And they've done experiments like, how long do we wait before giving somebody, uh, first of all, allowing them to say, hey, I need help, and then responding. And so there's some, some re research there. No, I mean, this, this research is, is, is testing sort of the difference between like uh, a second and seven seconds, something like that. Um, the other stuff in terms of that length of time, um, feedback is probably not useful over, the, over that period of time because you really, for most learning, you need feedback sooner than a day. People are people, so math or, or science or, or whatever, some of it's motivation, what are they interested in, right? Um, it really, it, that whole area, I'm not gonna touch, that, th th there are just preferences and, and people have, are interested in different things and may have aptitudes. There is the whole area, uh, so Howard Gardner published sort of different kinds of intelligences, that's not quite what he said it was, but I think there's some confusion there, but there is, there is ongoing research into um, and it falls under sort of expertise. Uh, so Erickson, you know, the, the fable 10,000 hours, there's that kind of stuff, and that's, there's a lot of research, research there. Uh, let me take somebody, Mike. So let me let me let me just take take some more questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's a that's a yeah yeah. Um, I personally don't know. I would guess there's an effect, whether it's positive or negative. I, I, uh, I, I, would, I would have to look at research. I, well, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, would, I would be surprised if it was a, yeah, I would be surprised if it was a positive effect, but there, but, um, but you know, look, we're, we're, we're still complex beings, and if maybe having a glass of wine means I'm more relaxed, because stress can affect, right? There's all sorts of, I mean, this is why this research is really hard, right? This is, we're not, you know, we're not experimenting with, with physics, we're experimenting, in a sense, with people that are really hard to, to work with. Uh, question back there. Maybe, maybe not. We, I, I would, I would look at randomized controlled trials for for that kind of thing. Yes. So as long as the, the more, so this, this has to do with the area of what's called complex learning. And so in order to have, to learn these complex concepts, you have to have the simple concepts. And once those become, once you become fluent in them, you are starting to create these connections and creating larger chunks. And so that enables you to work now with things that are more complex because the things that were complex in lots of pieces that you could barely hold in your working memory, now it's one chunk. And now you have space to now absorb this other complex stuff. And so the more you, as long as you're still exercising that, you know, how does HTTP get work, um, as long as you're still exercising that as you work on the more complex things, then you still retain that. But it's certainly possible you could be working now at this level and you've forgotten the details, but that's okay. Because you had learned it and you knew it well, and to recall it, you just have to reread it. Like I know when I started teaching this stuff again, I just like, how does that work again? Oh yeah. And then now I've established those pathways again. Because remember, long-term memory, it's there. It's not, doesn't disappear from long-term memory. It's just recalling it back is sometimes really, really hard. Yeah. 
No, I, I, so I, I have that, my son has that. Um, uh, there's research, and so you have to be really careful about the research around this stuff, and so I would be hesitant to make any concrete, specific things other than, um, I know I find, and so this is not advice, this in a sense of research-based, but I find getting started and is, the, is one of the hardest parts, um, and so this is associated with like procrastination and emotional stuff, and getting started and saying, I only have to work for five minutes, after five minutes, I stop. And so just giving yourself permission to say, I only need to do five minutes can, can sometimes really help. But, there's a whole, but that's a whole separate area of research that there's clearly a lot of money in it as well. So you have to be really careful about evaluating that research. Yeah. I tried doing five minutes thing, but then I ended up taking like an hour. I just like, I just, I, I can't stop. That's the, that's the idea. Because starting is the hardest part. And if you just say, look, I'm only committing to five minutes, anybody could do five minutes, for, you know, and then you, once you get started, it's very easy to just keep going. And then the hardest, then it's like, the hardest part is from there is like, okay, I've been going and I want to keep going, but you have to then remind yourself you're supposed to stop, because if you don't, then you won't trust yourself the next time you say only five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So that, there's, there's a lot of stuff there as, there as well, yeah. So in terms of like speed of videos and things like that, again, it depends on how much you know, how motivated you are, what is the material, how complex is it compared to what you know, how is it presented, right? There are a lot of variables there. Um, I find the same for, for, for a lot of stuff. Yeah, I can play it like almost two times speed, but then there's some stuff where it's like, can you slow it down even more and, and I'll play it at half speed. And so it's really just, um, there are some studies about sort of raw information transfer um, that relate very, very much to, to Shannon's law and so on about how much the brain can absorb and pay attention to, um, and so there's some some concrete research research on that. Yeah, back there. Yeah, his stuff is not quite backed by evidence. I would go to education. I would go to reproducible research in in some of that. And so some of the techniques I've, I've talked about and, and linked to that, I, I think are a bit more reliable. Um, because it's very, it's, you know, a lot of the stuff, it's very easy to fall into, this works for me, I feel comfortable with this, which has no relevance to how much learning happens. And this is the problem with like, I, I, I do this, right, so this is my, my job of, of doing a lot of training. And the thing at the end of the class that people get is like a survey of, how did you like this class? And that is completely meaningless because it's a judgment of how they felt and what they thought they learned, no a proper evaluation of what actually happened. Uh, there's a question. Mike. Um, um, I mean, the Pomodoro technique is, is really a time management, procrastination, ADHD thing, and that's sort of separate from, from the actual learning process. Um, I, I came across a couple, but not, not a lot. Yeah, I mean, again, this stuff is really, uh, it's really hard to research this stuff. Once you start looking at this research, like um, even something as like straightforward as maybe the forgetting curve, they're talking about very, very simple, memorizing words and, and maybe things placed on a screen, not like complex learning some complex task. And this is where my job as a, as a trainer is really hard because I have to look at the research and see how can I apply it, apply it to what I do. Um, so it's it's six o'clock. I want to let people feel comfortable. If you need to go, please please go. But I'll, I'll hang out and stay. And thank you so much for for your attention. So you can come up and.
you thought so